نحن مستر كلين مستر كلين از ذا ثيرد جيست سو بيفور وي بيجين ذس از ا a disclaimer that we we're, we're taking extra precautions uh, we have become clean freaks um, i think it's important to note that we have been taking extra precautions in particular the last maybe the last 10 days the last two weeks um, i think it's that's something that's mandatory and i think uh, i think a lot needs to be said that despite us maybe sometimes feeling more comfortable than others in given context and we can get into that uh, still it's re- reached the point where we're both making sure that we have masks um, everything washing hands washing hands yeah. uh, i mean everything everything possible walking everywhere most of the time walking everywhere and you're very nice you let me interview you back in mid february about topics that i think are still very important but we deliberately chose to not maybe get too deep into the geopolitics of the middle east for this conversation i think uh, it's almost like a lighter conversation about a very serious pandemic and just our own reflections on what's been happening to both of us I'm going to start off by just asking you Muhammad uh your your circle of contagion that sort of very close knit circle how many people do you see now now that we've sort of we've reached a sort of a critical moment heading towards late April how many people do you see on a on a regular basis um i would think i think it's three people probably including you <laughs> i've seen you several times since all of this started um and part of that is um i think just logistics who who is accessible yeah uh you know who is within uh walking distance or some distance in 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 a midway point and who is uh, who's also i think a lot of this depends on who's um willing to go outside and take a walk with yeah. with someone because there, there is um and um i've seen i've seen a few other people maybe since this um all started but more in passing or um kind of a, something that would involve arranging like going uh to some distance to meet a friend or a colleague um and it's never easy i mean all of this requires some i mean it requires planning by default but the extra precautions i think have let I mean, the reason I asked you is because I think I'm down to one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's you. Yes. Oh, that's a funny. Yes. <laughs> so a, you've got uh, at least two it's, more. It's yeah. been convenient. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yes. I was thinking now the last two weeks, mm-hmm. I've seen I I did see a couple which was in my circle up until two weeks ago. And then since then the few occasions I went out, I was with you. Mm. So that just to emphasize that we have taken extra precautions. Yes, probably in the last two weeks or so, two and a half weeks, I think I've seen you and one other person. So all of this is reminding me, and we've talked a lot about this. And, of how, and might, how, of how sad the moment is. <laughs> it is, but it's also reminding me, certainly how sad and how weighty it feels, and also how, um, how I think we all, we try, or I think one of the ways probably some of us Um, try to get around this is by making light of some aspects of yeah. it and which we might we might do today but more likely it's more a coping mechanism uh, but it's also reminding me and you and I have talked about this um, and in thinking about doing this um, this show this episode in the first place I think it's reminding me and especially the way you just put it a, a moment ago of the preparations one has to make yeah. it's reminding me of the civil war in Lebanon and the preparations one had to make to do anything mm. it, to go to the store yeah. the per- the preparations were it was a different kind of preparation because um, the risks and the dangers were different the calculation was different um, but also but it was something you had to do you had mm. to think about is there an active sniper i almost used the arabic word i almost say said anas is yes. there an anas on that street um you know is there an active sniper on the street and and a lot of that 
um, is, are things that you would hear word of mouth. You would hear not always reliably. You would ask your neighbors. You would figure out yeah. um, the route to the store that you're, the grocer that you, the, the can that you would be going to. Right. Um, you know, you would think about that. Um, you would think has something happened on that route earlier that day or earlier that week, and yeah. a lot of it is guesswork. Hmm. Kind of. I mean. Some of some of what we're, we've been doing for the last month, month and a half here in New York has been somewhat guesswork, but but also a lot of it based on the science and what we've been told. But I've yeah. thought in my own mind, I've I've thought a lot about that, and our conversations have reminded me of that. You actually I think it was maybe the last time I saw you, which was roughly a week ago. You you took me to Beirut by accident. We were walking up from Washington Square to, I believe it was up towards the Empire State Building, but we didn't, we stopped almost halfway. And you reminded me of the, of the, that kind of extreme silence on the streets and no one being outside, mm. that this almost felt like the wrong turn in Beirut mm -hmm. at a time of crisis, mm. that we're going the wrong way. It's yes. almost like you're getting too Which. close to Khatemes yes. or, you know, mm -hmm. this is a dangerous... Mm -hmm. Road, we should be going on the other one. Of course, mm -hmm. none of that is real. That's just you know mid Midtown in in COVID nineteen. Yes, but it did take me back to Beirut, but by accident. Mm -hmm. And I I know exactly what you're talking about, even though we're a few years apart. But we both have that kind of memory of danger. Mm -hmm. But before sort of getting, let's zigzag a bit because I think we can kind of sort of dance around both subjects together. That notion of fear. I know what that feels like, yet, at the beginning, I did not have that kind of fear when I went out. At the same time, I, it was obvious that overwhelming majority was taking extra precaution from the beginning, and that you suddenly did see people wearing masks, staying home, the streets were deserted quickly, yet I felt still okay going outside. Mm. And I think I felt like I felt almost, um, I knew that it felt like almost like a mistake that maybe I should not be outside. Mm. But I still, I would go to Central Park and I would see, you know, a few people with me. And then you became one of those sort of companions walking together. It didn't take, I mean, at the beginning, I didn't have any, uh, any immediate concern. Mm. That came the last two weeks. And I don't know if that's the same for you, that it sort of, you didn't feel so at risk at the beginning and then over time you kind of caught up to the um i haven't thought about it quite in that way um we i'm i'm, I'm gonna come back to that we're, we're probably gonna circle around a lot of things but what, what you just said about the empire state building mm -hmm. reminded me of something um, which is i think one of the experiences we've probably shared and one of the reasons we're seeing some parallels here is that experience and now the way you just put it that we were thinking of we almost took the wrong turn in that yeah. moment mm -hmm. it was too silent too quiet and i think it's the ways that uh anyone who's had some experience of some kind of civil conflict some kind of war whether civil war international war any any form of or or just being in a situation of that kind of ever-present danger and i think think you begin to see the echoes and the shadows of it and, and that was that was something mm, we were seeing mm. that night i think we were seeing the yes. shadows and echoes of that um and it's interesting that it struck you in that moment it didn't strike me that way but so, but something about it I, yeah. I, I could sense something about it there it's other situations in the last six weeks or so have struck me the, the mm. similar echoes and shadows of of that and it's very I think we can't co quite control when they sneak up on us in this way. But are these shadows from the Civil War for you, or are they more recent uh, memories? Probably a combination, probably, mm -hmm. both from the Civil War, yeah. but also um, from living, I mean, I lived in Baghdad, in, in yeah. Baghdad yeah. for uh, two years, and, and then back in Beirut in, from 2005 through around 2008, and then, uh, so that, that period, feeling episodes and and moments there yeah and i wonder i think i'm trying to think if i've become more cautious in the last few weeks than at the beginning um 
I was surprised by how sudden it happened. It, how suddenly I was surprised by how suddenly things uh, turned here, and that right. also was another echo. It was another right. shadow of of Lebanon, especially yeah. Lebanon, a little bit of Iraq, um, and how suddenly people just went inside it, you know, yeah. within days, and some of it was, it was gradual in some ways. But but the and the first two weeks were first two to three weeks were probably most difficult for me and and friends I was talking to not necessarily people I was seeing but uh, friends colleagues um, people and also family members dispersed in different places um, that I think that was the suddenness it was, it was how sudden all of this unfolded and the closures and that too I think was echoes of Lebanon during the war um, and other places during during conflict. You know, it's interesting. The closures take me back to the Civil War. Mm-hmm. But the deserted streets, I think it takes me back to 2008 only. Mm. And I, I think that's probably just because I, my Civil War years were mostly in Tripoli. The time that I was in Tripoli, you'd have car bombings. Mm-hmm. You'd have... You, there were, the Civil War dragged on, but it wasn't as violent in Tripoli. Yet there were people still on the streets. People were sort of going mm-hmm. about their daily lives. And I know that at times in Beirut, the streets were deserted. But my own immediate reaction is 2008. Those few days in Hamra, mm. kind of just too afraid to go outside. But it's just, it's a, it's a combination of events there that in a way line up here. Yet, and I, I'll say this openly, I... And I, maybe this was a mistake. I still felt okay at the beginning. Watching the news, knowing mm. what was happening, knowing everything is shutting down, I still felt okay. And I wonder if that's just sort of the comfort you feel while not mm. just, you know that this is not a Middle East-like scenario. That you still feel psychologically, uh, I don't know what the word is, almost like at ease to a point. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I honestly was not wearing a mask until recently, until it became more mandatory. Mm-hmm. I suspect your explanation, I suspect what you just said, that there's something about those echoes, that experience that maybe had given us some false sense of comfort. Yeah. Um, and partly because this is a, this is something you can't really see, right? You can't see it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can see some elements of civil conflict you can see people you can see men with guns you can see or shabab with guns you could see um you can see tanks during this war you could see uh the checkpoints you can see the mataris the 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 kind of you could see um it's it's interesting you mentioned how the the comparison between tripoli and beirut and i was in beirut in, in those years and i was you know, near, very close to Khat Damas. Uh, it was in Shayah, lived in Shayah, yes, yeah. and that was a. Uh, that is big, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sort of always it's Shayah and and Remeni, and and I remember the street in front of us, yeah. uh, Assad Assad, uh, would always would be abandoned because that was that was the front line. There were right. snipers often, yeah. and very few cars would get through it. Um, and you had to take back streets often to to get to places, and so that physical. So those are, that I would include that as part of the things you could see, you mm, knew, yeah. and people would go out on that street every once in a while. You'd hear about someone getting shot by a sniper going out on that street. Yeah, um, uh, there were sandbags and but barrels. It's interesting, filled. even the snipers, although you can't see them, mm-hmm. but you know. But you know, yes, yeah. Exactly. And there's a, there's a location that you mm-hmm. you know where to avoid. COVID, it's nothing like that. Yes, I mean. But it, I mean, I want to get into the why the average New Yorker. Let's forget New Yorker. Why most Americans, or at least most non-Arab Americans at this moment, have sort of that quicker response to this than we do, even in terms of conflict there in the Middle East. We're, mm. It's almost like a, there's a. I don't want to say they're more prepared. I don't think that's the case. I think it's just there's a more immediate need to react. And there, I was very surprised, one of those rare occasions, that this is not conflict-related, this is a global pandemic. The Lebanese, I think, were even faster. That mm-hmm. They responded immediately. And it's 
there's no sort of force mechanism there. Everyone just went home and then the streets were deserted. This is without authority. This is without even suggestion. This is people really sort of almost reminding me of there's no electricity. There's a way out. We'll get the we'll mm-hmm. get the motor. Uh, there's no water. That's fine. We'll order some water. And then there's a global pandemic. We'll go inside. We don't need to. We're not waiting for anyone to help us here. And I, that was very interesting. That's like a rare occasion where, at least in my experience, the Lebanese were faster. But that's very unusual. It is unusual. I mean, the government did act. Closing the airport was a huge step. Yeah. And, and the closing non closing restaurants and bars and, and yeah, kind of that's non, true. And then non essential businesses and. Um, and then imposing a curfew later on in, in, the, in the second phase, second stage. But I know, I mean, you tell me if you, dis- if you think otherwise, that authority in Lebanon only gets you sort of, mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't, there's very little of it anyway. So people did this on their own. Mm-hmm. That, I mean, obviously the airport shut down, but in terms of just the streets were deserted very quickly, I think out of local initiative. And it's, it was very surprising. Yeah, and although you hear, I mean, just what friends and relatives or people are telling me anecdotally is that in their neighborhoods, there's pretty healthy activity during the day. I mean, oh, some relatives tell me, oh, there's traffic, even though there's not not many shops are open, yeah. you sort of just see almost regular traffic during the day. Right. And then at night, it traffic doesn't even, despite the curfew, within a neighborhood, within a couple of block area, uh, within a radius of a few blocks, you see uh, people are out. There's the occasional car or occasional mm-hmm. young person on a moped, and, and, um, and it seems it's more going between different neighborhoods. Right, uh, right. And now there's... Right, there's the kind of sense that people are agitated and worried about the economic crisis again, and there's some people trying to go out on the streets again in different forms, whether they're, they're doing it in protest con, uh, caravans and convoys and yeah, cars. Yeah, I think and, it was even the last two days, yeah. right? We saw sort of that kind mm-hmm. of risk. Yeah, there was a parliamentary session, and and I guess for a, for a month or so, it refo it focused everyone's attention away from the economic crisis and yeah, now yeah. the economic crisis is getting worse and people are focused on it again um so you have both at once you have the pandemic mm-hmm. the risk and the need for the economy yeah. to work yeah. and some of it is probably experience people having an experience of going um into their homes go, it's kind of you know s- stepping back very quickly yeah it was inter- again anecdotally from just family members and friends uh it doesn't sound like there are shortages in the way that we we had shortages in new york of, right. in, in the first week or two as you remember the i mean paper. there was no there was no it doesn't seem like there were maybe there were some occasional to- toilet paper shortages in beirut or Lebanon, the masks were yes, impossible to get masks I mean, were that, impossible yeah. to get i mean i'm hearing I, I i talked to my sister in beirut yesterday and she says masks are still available um hmm. i mean there's a markup but they're available i think more widely than they are here um yeah. and that and i think in that way people in Lebanon had that experience of thinking well okay this is not a siege and this is not a war mm. so I think people mm. recognized that they don't really need to stock up in the way I remember in 2006 right at, in the first day or two I was living in Hamra um, the Hamra was Beirut and sort of and the first day or two of the war of the Israel Hezbollah war shelves were cleared out yeah. people started yeah. stocking up i mean people realized fairly quickly uh within 24 48 hours that this was going to be a siege um mm. and they shopped they stocked up and i guess that's one difference i noticed early on here despite all the government and kind of official assurances that food supply is going to be okay that um uh supermarkets were going to restock paper towels and toilet paper but in some ways i don't blame i mean you can't blame people who haven't been people haven't been through this kind of crisis before except maybe a hurricane or a weather yeah, event i was gonna say exactly were you were here for uh mm-hmm. katrina and that kind of sandy i was and, yes and, yeah so, so, in, oh i was here for not for uh sandy hurricane sandy, sandy. yeah katrina, Sorry, was, katrina was uh, was, uh louisiana and, yes uh, yeah so sandy you were here I was, I was in new york for hurricane sandy yes was there that kind of same 
reaction at least in terms of stocking up and and staying indoors and waiting there was staying indoors i lost power my building lost power i was in i was in an area i lost power mm. Uh, that was hard and lost power for four or five days. I mean, that was a very much a reminder. And I'd just been in Beirut uh, that, that summer so you, beforehand. So you, <laughs> for you, it's like, oh, great. Yes, <laughs> yes except there was no generator. That's, for, that's yes, there was no, Oh, that would be very no, funny if yes. NYU... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, they, they actually, NYU did have some buildings had, they actually had their own power plant. And we had its own oh. power plant, but they hadn't they hadn't set it up so all of all buildings right, some buildings right. had actually yeah. some um probably for hospital or that kind of like yes but also yeah. there, were, there were a whole bunch of it was very maddening we lived in housing complex and there were buildings across the street that were empty classrooms that were lit up because they had been left lit up because they were powered oh. those had been hooked up to the generators right and um, they've since changed the system and they're hooking up they're working but that's very lebanese the, where yes, the unnecessary where, stuff exactly. is lit up and everyone's exactly. doing, yeah Yes, oh. some un- some unnecessary buildings stayed lit up, and so and, you know sometimes I go to some, and they opened up to their credit. They opened up some of those buildings. You can go work and charge your uh, equipment in those in those oh. buildings. Oh, so it was useful nearby. at the end. It was yeah, 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 it was useful in some in some cases. Um, right, and this is a totally different situation here where everything is about distancing and being away from people, yeah. and being on your own and. Uh, and being away from groups and, and yes. not almost things you have to be self-sufficient in all these ways. Yeah. I want to ask you just this is a I mean it's it's a very light-hearted question but I think there's some maybe maybe there is some depth here I'll let you I'll let you you'll tell me whether or not this is deep enough to entertain. Is it simply that we're Lebanese that we are used to a, a level of crisis that it takes us time to catch up to a serious mm. crisis that's not in Lebanon. Meaning, uh, we were willing to see each other, we were willing to to uh, to eat together, we were visiting each other's apartments, even though we narrowed down the contagion zone. But we were okay, mm-hmm. and we felt okay. Is that a unintended sort of benefit when you're in a fairly chaotic part of the world for a long period of time? that you just navigate these situations better. And it could be false comfort. It could be that we're actually not meant to handle this crisis this way. This way yeah. If we're not in Lebanon, this is not Lebanon at mm-hmm. the end of the day. And this is a global pandemic. But still, that kind of... There is an unintended benefit here? I mean, possibly. We probably, we probably both stepped back or we both relied on that sense. Yeah. Um, and maybe thinking and maybe over confidently thinking in our ability past experience giving us some sense extra sense of figuring out danger yes. even though this danger is yes. completely um, invisible yeah uh, it's it's almost it's the one thing Trump has has portrayed it or has called it you the did invisible, it. Not, okay invisible you did it empty, uh, uh, sorry we've gone invisible politics enemy. okay yes. here we go yes, <laughs> yes. now the Trump, segue <laughs> Trump has called it the invisible enemy that's maybe the, I mean this is all in his uh, <laughs> attempt to blame it all on China or on foreigners especially China but um, he's been right about that it is invisible um, I'm not sure I, I've never I haven't loved and we're talking so much about the war we're talking so much about the Lebanese civil war I don't really love the war comparison to this because mm, putting mm. people on a war footing yeah, um, is, yeah. is always problematic and it's always sure. it, um, it's, it's often uh, wrong it's often misplaced um, but yes this is a danger you can't really see and you're probably right there's something that gave us some extra confidence that we probably shouldn't have had um, yeah extra confidence that was baff- we were all, I guess, baffled, possibly including the people who were uh, stocking up on toilet paper themselves were poss- probably baffled for why mm. uh, that happened. But one of the things I was baffled by was um, people stocking up on bottled water, uh, which is a little unusual. I mean, the New York City water, I know some people don't either like the taste or worry about it. It's actually one of the cleanest, um, you know, sort of best, public water sources in the world and yeah. and then it just got me to think well i mean and a lot of times these these fears of course are not rational um and we've all had them 
um, but it gets you to think well okay if if people are really worried that the tap that their tap is going to run dry that the water is going to stop coming in the tap um, it's good to be prepared to some extent with that bottled water but if, if we get to that point where the tap run dry runs dry where the system the infrastructure collapses to the degree where the water no longer reaches you mm. then then there are bigger problems right. on the horizon at that point and I guess long term, that's a that is a crisis at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not something New York can handle long term. And yeah, and that would be a crisis where then basic, and it took the Lebanese in Lebanon. I mean, I saw a slice of this in Iraq. It takes people quite a bit of time to jerry rig the systems to yeah. to make do. Right. I mean, the, in in Lebanon, you would start. I mean, it wasn't. I remember the time before generators, where people would um, have Still, a car battery oh, like, and, oh, and, right. and and charge the battery during the day yeah, when yeah, yeah. when there would be a, some electricity, um, and then you would run a fluorescent bulb, and yeah. maybe if you had a large enough battery and a little more sophisticated setup, you could possibly run a TV off of it right. or a radio, more likely. Um, you took me back to the the stealing, stealing electricity, <laughs> okay, stealing. and I mean it was the most obvious theft, mm-hmm. right? And then. Nobody would take sort of credit for it, but then you'd have this extra wire dangling, mm-hmm. and somebody is benefiting off of it. And yes. yeah, it takes time, but that's that's not an overnight thing. That's uh, for people to get used to, for people to jerry rig these systems yeah. and get used to the workarounds. Um, and people would do that here. I think that people would, but with some time. Mm. Um, so and. I guess going back to your, I'm not sure how to answer your original question of did we have some false, uh, did we have some uh, false hope, not false hope, hope. did we have some uh, just false comfort or, um, and and we possibly did um, in, in this situation. We had some false sense of security around it. Or maybe that we've survived dangerous mm-hmm. things before and that we can survive this as well. But it's everything you've said is, is resonating. Invisible versus visible. Mm-hmm. Lebanon, it's usually most wars. I know you, the analogy is not always correct. That's true. But just the fact that you could see a threat, period. Yes. And that, that in itself changes the whole dynamic. It, it, it does yeah. change. I mean, but also the other thing, this is probably the part been thinking about this the past six weeks and and this is the part that's hardest it's hardest to put your finger on this which is joe biden's uh, chances of winning <laughs> yes. that too yes <laughs> there's there's that uh but the but the part the part that's where it's really hard to put your finger on is is this idea of um that that there is the the danger the, the, the invisible because you're also in a place like Lebanon and Iraq and places where there's now and now Syria which I don't have firsthand experience of the war there but um, in those places that have been that we've been in or near mm-hmm. um, you kind you have the physical manifestations of the war and, and the physical sense of danger but you also always know that there's a chance that something invisible or something really unexpected can happen. For right, example, right. a stray shell, a, yep. a stray rocket, a stray missile. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the danger. And that's one place where this is interesting to step back on and, and think about this, that your, you know, the public health authorities, the government authorities here are telling you, if you stay home, you'll be safe here. Right, Whereas right, in right. a conflict, you can stay home. You're likely safer than being outside, yeah. uh, but you're not entirely. You can't. No one can assure you that you can be entirely safe, right, at home. So I mean, at no, least here, there is something to go. Something. Yeah, yes. that's interesting. I mean, there's some way. Yeah. You know, you might not be in during COVID. I mean, I guess potentially, you know, New Yorkers live in buildings. There, there, there's density. There's touching I mean, yeah. common areas. There's. You, you it's came not into purely, this, You saw the building right when you walked mm-hmm. in. All those signs in the elevator, yes. and I think the tissue box. Yes, there's a in 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 the in the elevator in, yeah. your, in your apartment building. Your your apartment has designated that you know to prevent to have people um, 
residents and visitors not touching the buttons. It's a smart idea. I have a box of tissues and people can dispose press, each yeah, one. Dispose and tissues, yes. but that yeah. So that's the I Those mean small. that's yeah. that's the kind of where you do have risk at home. Mm-hmm. Of course, very different than a stray shell or a like a, a bullet yes. flying through your window. But but that there is it's not completely safe. It's you're not hundred percent immune. Being in New exactly, York at home, yes. yeah, or you're, you're not, anywhere. yes, and no, and yeah. no, and I, but the messaging has been that you're, and and it's true. I mean, that is yeah. that is that is what's it seems to be what has cut the transmission. Yes. I mean, shutting down society and and having people in their homes, yeah, um, and that's where I think I wonder where our calculations were probably a little bit different, um, or at least initially they would be. That we're thinking, okay, there's the staying at home, which keeps you, and and you know we both happen to be lucky in that we have jobs and work that allows us to do that. that we don't have to yeah. um, go out, you know. As I mean, that's a that's been one of the things that's been missing in a lot of certain a certain segment of New York and the U.S. Um, that is that's been talking and up out front on this issue. And and some some of this segment has a blind spot in that they're not thinking about these essential workers. I mean, yeah. they're, they're yeah. publicly appreciative of it, but but there are certainly huge segments of the population that can't stay at home, and that actually enables those workers, whether it's sanitation workers who pick up the garbage, keep the streets. That's essential. We learned what yeah. can happen and. Lebanon and other places, Iraq and other places, when you don't, when you can't pick up garbage, you can't do the provide the basic services. Uh, the workers who run the trains and buses, so that sure. other work, other essential workers can get the workers in grocery stores. This is besides the most obvious kind of yeah, healthcare absolutely. infrastructure to run, and um, and also just even thinking of to to receive a grocery delivery. That if you're going to be at home and not you know, and not go out to the grocery store. Yeah. Um, there are multiple workers in that chain, maybe four or five people who will be involved in gathering your groceries, mm-hmm, processing mm-hmm. it, and sending it off. And those are all. You know, I, I wonder if some people don't. I mean, in in the um, in the sense that some some people are projecting of. Let's all stay home, which is which. To, you know, they're they're not quite thinking always about that segment of people who can't stay home. Yeah, um, and who now we're seeing from some of the data and figures are are the most exposed naturally um, to the virus in the last several waves. I think that's that's a very good way of explaining that that barrier, that psychological barrier when you're at home and just your food magically appears. Mm-hmm. I mean, you don't really think about it. You don't think about all the steps mm-hmm. it took and how many people were involved and the fact that they're risking their lives. Yes. You don't really, it doesn't, yeah. I mean, I think it's there, but you don't actively think about it. And people have turned to delivery. Yes. So that, I mean, if and anything, that's, that's and how there's people an are. an argument so, to yeah. be made that if you're healthy and you're not in a high risk group, there's, I think, some argument to be made that, and if you can reasonably get to a grocery store, yeah. wear a mask and get you I mean there's some arguments you made that you should do that shopping yourself because yeah. you're cutting down on other people's exposure it's a and that's like a calculation that right. people need to make i think we've all done some version of this or we've all experienced some version of this during the last six weeks of talking to and just reaching out and being reached out to by mm. various people that we haven't may not have talked to us regularly yeah um and thinking about and, and hearing from people especially people outside of new york um you know who sort of really see see the news and and think that you know you you would walk out into, into the street in new york and you would die and and there was an interesting there's an interesting twist to that and, and that was often how people thought times i lived in beirut or or Baghdad, mm-hmm. and that's how people thought too that you would be you know, you'd somehow instantaneously die, or something horrible would happen to you as soon as you stepped outside. Yeah. Um, and and you kind of, in your own mind, think, well, you know, no, this doesn't happen, and 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 that people have jumped to that assumption, and in some ways, it always looks worse. 
from the outside. Right, um, right. That, uh, and people are surprised that there's some traffic in the streets in New York, just as they're surprised that there's traffic in Baghdad or that there's yeah. traffic and things going on. Some some places open in Beirut. And um, actually, this situation is probably... In all those three places, there are far fewer places open and, and people out on the streets uh, than than there would normally be in right, in, in a right. crisis. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, so there's yeah, I think I've done some reflecting on that and and thinking about. I mean, I was also thinking and I, I've been thinking in these couple of weeks just journalistically about the questions I have and things yeah. I'm interested in and um, and some of the neighborhoods where um, I grew up after Beirut so from age 10 11 yeah, uh, yeah. You know, for for a number for a decade or longer um, were neighborhoods that have, these are neighborhoods that have been really hard hit in Queens by right. by covid-19 and um, and I've been you know I've been reading about them and trying to understand what's happening and why and mm. and thinking mm. about the changes those neighborhoods endured and it's, it's actually quite a nice segue from sort of getting into that. You're, you're talking about a bus driver who risks sort of his or her life uh, to take passengers and a bus driver who passes away as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, you have these all these essential services uh, from medical to whatever you want, just that kind of risk takers that are helping us glide through this uh, pandemic. And every single day at 7 p.m., you and I have witnessed this, I think maybe two or three times together, uh, we're late walkers yes. <laughs> or evening strollers that the city celebrates. And uh, I think I've had the, well, It's you get used to it. It's funny, they've been doing this, I think for about three or four weeks now, if not longer every day and uh, any second now very early on yeah and I think it was inspired I guess it started in Italy I think yes it, it started it, in Italy it, right it, it got inspired right. in Italy and then it moved to other parts of Europe and then yeah. and then it got to New York fairly early on it's been probably almost a month and it starts yes it's starting And it gets a little louder as we get, it's, it's almost seven. It's a minute to seven. This is premature celebration. There we go. I associate this now with New York, but the first few times it took me back to the protests in Beirut. Beirut. Mm. Yeah. And it's because I never imagined anyone else being able to just bang pots, pots and, pans, and pans and then here you go. People are doing yes. it. Yes. Or some and sometimes you see a car passing by and it will honk the horn. Yeah, yes. I mean to me that is so that so is not America. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a testament to what how unusual of a moment this is yeah. and, and I was taking an Uber I, it was a few days ago or maybe, maybe a week ago it was, maybe it was going to meet you maybe at, at near NYU and it passed 7 o'clock and the Uber driver was sort of reluctantly honking the mm. horn because there was a cop passing by the cop was honking <laughs> too but it's just like a, is it okay mm -hmm. to do this here mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah it's um yeah, the rituals that develop around, I mean, this is one of the rituals. This is probably the one um, that's now become most associated with uh, the, the, most, the, the most regular daily ritual that we're seeing out of this yeah. uh, crisis. And I think it's something people look forward to. Yeah, it's clearly. every day there's that five minute window. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and people have done twists on it some... There have been some days where um, people would play New York, New York, the song. And, yeah, we saw <laughs> another. Uh, oh yes, that yes, that there was an evening when we were walking. We yeah. saw a, a part in, in the West Village where there's um, people are playing uh, the song from their stereos and um, and a way for people, I guess, to feel connected in across yeah the boundaries. Yeah. 
you have some persistent uh, pot bangers in your neighborhood. A little bit, you know, one one thing it reminded me of, and, and this we're about to start Ramadan, is of right. course the uh, Happy Ramadan, yes. Ahmed. <laughs> Thank you, Happy Ramadan <laughs> to you too. But right <laughs> of uh, the spoor and the guy who comes around and ba- literally bangs pots and pans to get you up, yes, so right. you can have your spoor, so you can eat before the fasting starts. Yeah, um, and that's a very communal communal thing. It's and and this is. It's usually a man, and he will and he will do it. Yeah, he'll have a certain zone area that he works in, and um, without people throwing tomatoes at him yes. to <laughs> stop waking them up at four in the morning. <laughs> in a few places, yes, in a communal, very different context, but yeah, a kind of a communal ritual, an yeah. old time, old ritual. But I like this common thread that anywhere on the wor- anywhere in the world now, this is happening. This is not a localized thing. I had this conversation with several people for the podcast and in private that you will not need to share this story to a foreign audience. There's no need to explain Mm. the moment. I mean, you're reporting from Baghdad. Most people understood Iraq through a journalist's lens in Iraq. Very few people went to Iraq Mm. to try to witness the war up front. A handful of people did this. And they provided the story to a mass audience, a worldwide mm-hmm. audience. We're all going through this, so there was, I think I don't think there will be many storytellers born out of this moment in particular because it's something we all went through mm. together. Or maybe, or maybe there we might see stories of how it played out and played out in different ways. Right, and, right. And which res- which places had more restrictions than others? Where were you able to do If anything, less? maybe the New York reporting scene, that will have that sort of edge mm-hmm. because this is the hardest hit place. Yes, but, but yeah. it's also the place that did, it didn't... New York didn't have or hasn't had as severe restrictions as some other places like Italy, like yeah. France. That's true. Uh, like even in some parts of New Jersey, they've closed parks and things yeah. like that. And, and there have been things... And I think that's probably largely due to Andrew Cuomo, I think realizing we're getting in, we're straying into politics a little bit, but maybe we can for the heck of it. Um, just Cuomo realizing that in a place as big as New York, the state as a whole and, and certainly the city, mm. there is no way you need compliance. There's no way to enforce compliance yeah. with this. And if you shut off all the valves, if you shut off parks, if you shut off any possibility of people to go out yeah. and just um, you know, feel normal to some extent, to walk around, and um, and also the city is dense in this way, and, and you know, if, if you don't have streets open to to be able to do it, you need you need access to the parks and green space, which is already limited in the city. Um, they closed the playgrounds at one point so that there was yeah, no demonstration. Right. They closed um, active sports like basketball courts and other things like that. But um, it was smart of Como, I think, to keep mm. the parks open. And uh, possibly Mayor de Blasio, I think, I think he went along with it. It's not entirely clear if he would have budged without Como. And there was yeah. also that debate about closing the schools, whether right, or not to right. close the schools. And, and now there's a lot of um, kind of second-guessing and... I guess as it's called the kind of Monday morning quarterbacking and 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 the kind of you know seeing these decisions and saying oh New York should have closed yeah, a, yeah. a lot of people are you saying and on social media especially that New York should have done the full scale shelter in mm-hmm. place or closure order four days earlier uh, like a lot of cities in California did and but the the problem with that New York was pretty much closed by uh, March sixteenth which is when the schools the day the schools closed. But March, right. They announced right. school closure that weekend. That Monday, schools closed, the, yeah. and then also that weekend, the previous weekend, um, they announced mostly Governor Cuomo, but some of it was citywide as well, closing bars and restaurants and nightclubs and all of that by the seventeenth. And then it wasn't. It was yeah. a full week before the full um, the full shelter in well, Cuomo didn't want to call it shelter in place. He called it New York on pause. Yes. He didn't like the term. Um, there were a few days where it was a third occupancy was okay. Yes, and then there were there kind was, of like a yeah. testing. It's, it's and not entirely. I I I don't know the. I certainly don't know the science. Um, it seems from what we were seeing now that the disease has been spreading for a long time, and and yeah. that those couple of days 
may not have made the huge difference that some people think. And there's this issue of social, again, you need, as Cuomo and other leaders realized, you need people to cooperate. And if closures had started in February, would people have really cooperated at that stage? Right. That's a, because they hadn't seen, I'm not sure they would have. Um, you also kind of needed the experience of Italy and France and, and those countries to go through it. You needed right. the sense of a Western democracy going through this. And, Do you sense and Italy was that turning point where they, the numbers were so dramatic that people were quicker to respond here? I think so. It definitely played a part, mm. uh, the dramatic numbers, the overburdened healthcare system, the overburdened hospitals. Yeah. I think that was a huge seeing that yeah. play out. Yeah. Um, people could have written off China or somewhere else, somewhere in the developing world, thinking, oh, this is not going to happen here to us in the West, if they didn't see that here's a Western, and Italy has, a, in quite a few respects, a better healthcare system than yes, many parts yes. of the U.S., yeah. Um, and n not everywhere, but but certainly, I mean, New, New York has a fairly strong healthcare system. Um, there's the question about well, how many beds New York had and ventilators yeah. and that yeah. kind of preparedness, but you know, amazing hospitals and doctors and a concentration. Um, but yes, it, it needed that turning point where Italy n people in the world needed to see the level of damage that, that the virus was doing in Italy, the danger to the healthcare system, and also the idea of the closures, closing down society, and seeing it in a place like Italy. Yeah. I think that... The that, other parts of Europe. Right. And it was, I mean, even other countries in Europe, I think, were slow. I mean, it, the UK was slower than the US to a point. And then Boris Johnson gets mm -hmm. infected, and mm -hmm. at some point critical, and I think it's just as... Uh, it's a very strange moment that we're both going through. And I really am excited to see the city come back to life. I want to just, I want to be here and watch New York uh, spring back. I do wonder, in our own experience, if people who've been going out more, sort of doing a bit more, I mean, not, not breaking the rules, not breaking the law in, in the extent of, um, but within the parameters that were defined in New York, uh, taking advantage of those parameters by mm -hmm. uh, walking, um, trying to socially distance yourself while you're walking, um, going to the grocery store, doing the essential things you have to do, um, versus people who decide, who stayed at home for most of that part. I have a, I have a sense, I don't really have evidence for this, but I have a sense the longer you stayed at home, um, the more, the greater the fear factor, the, yeah. the greater the factor you have to overcome. And that makes, I mean, I might be harking back to um, a little bit of Lebanon and Iraq uh, on that, but, um, uh, and, and, and so I might be wrong and the comparison may not be accurate, but it feels that people, um, you know, as, as more time goes on, you would have more fear about going back out. Um, if whereas if you've taken daily or near daily daily steps, risks, yes. quote unquote, not uh, right. Yes, or if you've taken those, um, then you're more adjusted. Yeah, um, but it's also it's also it's also individual. I mean, I bet there are people going stir crazy and want to go out and want the chance to. Uh, maybe at least at first in public almost mingle with people and be near yeah. people and um but there will be situations like, and people you know i mean the subways are going to be a problem um people are going to be reluctant yeah uh, people are going to be reluctant about getting into elevators um right. there's a lot, and restaurants i mean who you know that's um i guess outdoor space that seems to be a, a, a safer zone and maybe there'll be some um, system and places where restaurants will be will be more outdoors and gatherings can be yeah. uh, smaller but also outdoor. You know, it's... I mean, most people I know in New York have been doing just that. They've been afraid at home. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I would not have been able to do that. I'm looking back now. I think it was just too... 
I volunteered to walk a friend's dog out of the need to get out and just do something. They were not leaving their apartment. Mm-hmm. So I'm taking the dog for mm-hmm. a walk. Um, I enjoyed the, the walks we took together. I think they were, I needed them. Or even just taking a stroll period. Going to the supermarket was almost like, I have to do this. I'm not going to do delivery because I need to get out. And yeah, I, I am really impressed with anyone who's been able to just lock themselves in properly. And I guess that shows that it's it's a very, very difficult uh, demand to ask everyone to just stay inside as long as you can. And I think that's mm-hmm. sort of like a... Maybe that's an admitted flaw that this uh, this pandemic maybe would have moved faster had the whole planet shut down properly for two weeks. Maybe there would have been a period. I don't know, and I don't really know enough about the science and how it, and, and even that. But then you you it, you can't really shut everything down because there's enough enough yeah. needs to happen. And enough people yeah. need to get to right. places that. Um, that it can't. I mean, if you shut everything, I mean, then then really your tap will run. Then your electricity won't work, and your tap water won't arrive. So I there mean, would have consequences days, there. That there, would, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, right. There would be a. Um, you know, there are places where, um, you know, possibly there could have been some shorter uh, shutdowns if if they had been really really early. But all the things we've read about and we've heard talked about the great lengths about the failures in testing and all of these um, procedures and protocols Um, but yes it is yes it's 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 an unnatural thing to do to to be at home and have to um, and and there as we talked about a little bit earlier there are people who just can't do it and and those people are putting themselves because of their work, their jobs at, at tremendous risk. Well, that's, that's a very important point to emphasize. And I don't think it's emphasized enough, actually. You're right that they are risking their lives so that we can move yes. on from this. Yeah. They're risking their lives so yeah. their society can move on like this. And they're risking their lives so that the vast majority of people can stay at home can I, to make it right. possible for so many other people to stay at home. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a good reminder. I don't, I don't proactively think about that enough, I think. And I think it's good to hear that uh, more. I want to wrap up by asking a few questions that relate to you specifically because of your career and your profession and something that I know many, many people are doing, but it's just not in my orbit. You're a professor. You're instructing online. Mm -hmm. I believe Zoom is the preferred uh, portal, but uh, you're, I'm guessing, mostly at home lecturing your, your students. And... We kind of spoke about this, this kind of un- unanticipated anxiety when it comes to that sort of regular, uh, that regular experience. And I think I just want to get your own feedback on that, that what it's like for you trying to get your students engaged mm-hmm. online mm-hmm. and just the interaction with students in general. And if there is anxiety where you see it coming from exactly and just the experience of trying to keep a university going, going. and again i i ask you in particular because journalism i mean it's by default <laughs> you don't want to be socially distant right yes exactly yes. you want to be socially as intimate as possible without crossing mm-hmm. any lines we also spoke about film direction mm-hmm. that's a program that's probably in, like it's just it's so difficult to require students to be among people to teach, yes. and to teach it in this kind of situation. So if you could mm-hmm. share as much as you'd like about that. Yeah, I think there are layers of anxiety for students, for teachers, for and we're seeing it across the board in, I mean, certainly at colleges, but also you're definitely seeing it with schools. I mean, I hear, I don't have direct experience with this, but I hear, you know, stories from friends who have kids and um, you know how difficult it is, especially younger kids. How difficult it is to get young kids to focus in on, um, and especially where at ages where uh, kids, where schooling is important for kids because of socialization. Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, even at college, 
certainly undergrad and graduate students, uh, the social aspects of being in college are really important too to be around your classmates, course, all yeah. the things that happen, all the conversations uh, that happen outside of class, yeah. all of the interactions, uh, living in a different city potentially, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and the way, and like everyone else, students were shocked and taken aback by how quickly things yeah. closed down, by um, the way that universities uh, moved online so quickly often actually faster than government regulations a lot of a lot of private universities yeah. in the u.s especially in the northeast um moved to online instruction around the time of spring break as it's right, mid-march right. um they used that as a time to make the transition mm. um and it was, yeah, it was done very fast and and asked everyone to do a lot of work to rejigger um uh, rejig your syllabi, rejig your plans for the semester, just change things as the world was changing as a whole right. in these huge ways. Um, this was also changing and certainly students have anxiety and teachers have anxiety about the change in their lives. Um, yeah, yeah. You don't know what all the things that students are dealing with in um, you know, cases where they've gone back home, uh, cases where they might have uh, sick parents or relatives cases where uh, students' parents or relatives or loved ones lost jobs. I mean, all of the things that yeah. um, that this crisis has brought and then trying to keep some semblance of normalcy, of continuing classes, um, of continuing instruction, of, of keeping up with the curriculum. So... You know, we've, I mean, in my classes have changed assignments. My colleagues have done this as well. Journalism, as you said, by its nature, you kind of want to interview people. You want to observe the, people, yeah, be on the ground, yeah, to, sure. to see things, to be a fly on the wall in a Absolutely. lot of cases. Yeah. And this is the antithesis of that. You can't be, um, in so many cases, you can't be a fly on the wall. There's not, there's not even walls left to be a fly on because so many things are just... Uh, you know, circled back and, and are now inside, you know, you can still reach out to people for interviews on the phone. Probably uh, people have a bit extra time and might mm. be able to answer your questions or to take <laughs> up inquiries from students in ways they may not have been able to. But the, the kind of face-to-face -face personal interaction, the personal observation that students ideally would do in journalism classes you know, a lot of that disappeared and, and disappeared overnight. Um, a lot of the advantages of being in New York in a media capital, um, a lot of news organizations are now suffering economically. Uh, they've canceled yeah. summer internships. There, there are a lot of ripple effects. Um, the internships are really essential, I mean, for students. It's a way um, you know, students who want to develop careers in journalism it's a way to make professional contacts it's a way to get real um, intensive experience while they're doing this so all of this and a lot of this got changed on the fly um, I mean even though in a place like New York news organizations actually are deemed Governor Cuomo deemed them essential businesses so they, they can operate um, mm. but they, you know, they want to keep the workers safe and, and they want to keep some sense of distance and a lot of things can be done remotely uh, by news organizations mm. so mm. Um, I think figuring a lot of news organizations figuring that they can't quite reopen in the same way by the summer made the decision to cancel summer internships and uh, probably not take on not take on the task of readjusting you know getting interns to work remotely which also def defeats some of the purpose of being in a, at a news organization or an office so that's that's proof that you can't transition everything to online whatever, online courses or online programs, it just doesn't work. So you do need to have some, eventually some human contact for in, things to just work up to a point. In, yes, in some, I mean, you can transfer, there, there are some courses in journalism and other topics that you know lend themselves with some tinkering and mm. revising. Um, adjusting assignments, adjusting the way you interact, um, that can be switched, yes, and, and, yeah. and 
we've been in the process of you know there's also trial and error and seeing what right, things right. Uh, can be done and what and what things can you know generate it, it's hard to have the same kind of discussion I, I think there's also something about um the zoom or skype or so whatever or google hangouts or so whatever form um and we think of them and i think people are craving the kind of seeing people yeah. but there's also something that tires you out and you're constantly looking at people and looking at what cues they have and yes i remember you mentioning this and it was it was uh I, you i i remember you, you you made the point of we don't need to do it was uh, maybe a friend or a colleague wanting to have a zoom chat yes and you that could be done on a phone call yeah, I, yeah, know, like, I, I don't need saying, to yes, see, yes, yes we can just do this the norm yes. The, the usual way yes. yeah i don't need to see you <laughs> which is less i think far less stressful to everyone yeah you know people have seen it i think it does give people the sense okay i'll sit at my desk i'll sit in my chair i'll be um you know, i'll sort of i'll have my whole setup and and this will feel like a normal work day but it's it's not it's yeah. um you know, and and you know we're used to well I don't know, of certain generations were used to phone calls and, and phone calls are coming back. And yeah, and, that's true. And they're just yeah. as good in, in some ways, <laughs> I think, and in some ways they can be better than video calls. Um, I mean, not, not, I mean there'll be instances where you, you'll certainly want to see people. And this does, not to bring everything back to Lebanon and the war, I mean, it does, we are in this world where, you know, three decades ago, now four decades with, with the Lebanese civil war, you know, it was it was so hard to make a phone call. I mean, of course, I mean yeah, when I was first in the U.S. Yeah. in in the mid '80s, the um, and yeah, the and to get yeah. to get through, from, even from the U.S. end, it was so expensive. And yeah. now we don't even think about it. I call my sister, I call my mom, I call my relatives every other day. I'm yeah. calling yeah, yeah. on WhatsApp. I mean, often voice because also the internet is not reliable in Lebanon on that end, and it's just easier. But the fact that you can do it so regularly and, yeah. and in the past um, that was it was a, I mean maybe you would do it every couple of weeks or once a month um, just because of prohibitive cost uh, because of the way that you have to call the central and they have to dial your even you know even if you had someone in your family who had a working phone line which wasn't assured yeah um, well, they had to have electricity. They had to have electricity often. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because, although, although some, sometimes, 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 sometimes the phone, the phone yeah. lines would work without right. yeah, even, right. even much old, you know, so yeah. the rotary phones didn't need the electricity. Right. Um, but you needed you needed a working phone line that hadn't been cut off by the war. Um, it was just it was a process. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and there were ways. There were things people would do. There were ways around it. I, mean, I remember writing letters, the family, and also and recording audio tapes, which is really interesting. And so I don't know if you. Wow. Kind of, we we used to do that in in the late eighties, early nineties, yeah. of just like recording with that with the, as we're doing now, we're right. doing it with, the, say, with yeah. a microphone and a tape recorder, but then and you, then sending it, yeah. and you send it in the mail. More often, we would send it with someone actually, because be the because right. you would send a letter in the mail, and right. sending a cassette would get uh, wrapped up in customs and things. Yeah. And, but uh, if someone was going, you would give it, you know, as you were giving them things to take, uh, letters, yes, but, and potentially audio tapes, and and so. Our you, generation has seen a lot of change. Mm -hmm. You just, I mean, you literally, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I know that pencil you have to put in in case the yes, cassette wiring yes. gets jumbled in the luggage. Exactly. You yes. want to make sure that they hear it properly. And mm -hmm. and it's a snapshot of time. You're giving yeah, people, yeah. you're giving your loved ones a snapshot of your moment, uh, of that moment in time, but also um, your, it's a snapshot of... Um, your own interaction with them and the kind of longing for home and the longing um, for that closeness with them, with them. Yeah. and I wonder if we're feeling some moment of that here too but, but we're so. mediated by all this other technology that we didn't have right? Um, and that we think brings us closer but it still makes us long for um, yeah. for the contact it's a, it's a far more connected version of that experience mm -hmm. and it's a false connection to a point because I agree with you a bit too much video can be mm -hmm. can be exhausting yeah exactly and and I think it uh, and it brings it up can uh, keep, yeah sorry it can keep conversations I mean in letters and and in those audio tapes and in the phone the phone calls um, 
would be a different category because the phone calls were so logistically difficult and it would need to be short. Yeah. But in any of those audio tapes or letters, you would you would um, you 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 would probably get at more a deeper insights to yeah. convey deeper feelings than you do in many voice and and video calls that we can do now. I think WhatsApp has killed that kind of uh, connection, if you will, that mm -hmm. patience, that you know willingness to listen to someone that you miss that you love dearly spend 30 minutes of their time sharing mm -hmm. something about them as opposed to a uh emoticon yes as opposed to text and message yes of course now we're gonna sound like two grumpy old men no that's, but the problem but the not, thing is we're not the problem we're not, is yes, we're not we're, i mean we're technically not old yes and i think we're fairly light-hearted we're not too grumpy yes, <laughs> but but it's that's true nice. there's something about it's that that we we know this era and I think mm -hmm. we enjoyed it. There's so many disadvantages to it as well. It's not like I think I think there's a balance that hasn't been made and we're learning mm -hmm. because this is the first time that we've ever experienced this kind of situation where the internet's readily available yet there's a global shutdown at the mm -hmm. same time. So it's an odd sort of uh, calibration. But there is but there is in you know in 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 the 80s and 90s I'm sort of thinking of and I'm sure I'm, um, uh, you know, over. Wait, I can't think of the word in English. I'm um, well. I, yeah, I'm over sentimentalizing this. Mm. Um, that um, there's something about the communication f felt was special. You didn't take it for granted. You yeah. didn't take yeah. if you um, made a call, you know, every other week or something. People looked forward to it, and 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 they weren't. Um, or it was just special to you be able to send an audio tape or send those letters and, and get that back. And, you know, people, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're reading too these stories about that the phone call and the letter are back. Um, yeah. And, like, and the long email, which sort of was in, intermediary. Right. People right. are, and people are adjusting and people want to share. Yeah. Um, um, these, this moment and, uh, share it with loved ones and, and share yeah. the kinds of things they're thinking about and um and you know we're doing it in these different ways and but we not there's an ease of communication that i think we're taking for granted yeah we've taken for granted over over several decades now maybe a decade, sure. at least one if not 15 one decade or 15 years you know then we also we've talked about this um just the idea that everything will change that people think um, I suspect people are too quick to jump to that. We've had, yeah. even in our lifetimes, quite yeah. a few moments that, that are really big and important and seem seem like things can't continue. Mm. And people do go back to a normal pattern. Yeah, like that's we, true. We, we've seen that quite a bit. And, um, and this will that's, recede. That's the most familiar yes, way. Yes, yeah. that this yeah. will recede in, in memory. Well, in the meantime... Uh, if COVID-19 gave me something beneficial, it's uh, the, the the need to stay focused because productivity is important. And I am lucky I've been still able to release these episodes on a regular basis. And many of the guests have encouraged me to do video and I just made it a default option. You're the first person I've met in person and sort of did an episode together in person mm -hmm. since mid-March. Mm. So it's a month of Skype, Skype, yes. Skype. It's great to do this in person again. <laughs> I'm glad. Along yes, with you. video. <laughs> yes. And for everyone that watched, this is a mandatory component now to the <laughs> yes. podcast. Uh, I'll be spraying both of us after <laughs> this. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming up uh, to, uh, to the Upper Upper West Side. I know it's usually this would be an hour long journey in rush hour, if not longer. It's crazy that this takes 20 minutes. It's a glide across yes, Manhattan. That, that, yes. And I was, you know, it's funny. I thought 5 p.m. would be risky. It's 5 p.m. is nothing during COVID-19. Mm -hmm. It's empty. It's deserted. So thank you for doing this. And uh, thank you for having me. You no, know, and I appreciate thank the ability to kind of reflect as a journalism, as a journalist, as a professor and as a New Yorker. Who has that lens into the Middle East? Who I think probably considers Lebanon still a home, and you're, For sure, yes. you're able to kind of uh, 
sort of uh, bring both to life during this moment. So thank you, Muhammad. Thank you for having me, Ronnie.